Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to talk about the theme of from corporate science to science for society. I've always been drawn to science and technology ever since childhood. I've always been fascinated by the way the world works, and I've always enjoyed building things out of um, you know, Lego and Meccano when I was a small child. Um, and so it was no surprise that I started a career in science and technology, and I went to university and I studied physics and engineering. And I started to find out in detail about use, and then started to think about misuse. And then I took a year out in industry, and the first major project I worked on was weapons research for a major arms corporation. I did research on and development on image intensifiers, which are used in night sights, which are fitted on top of rifles and enable soldiers to shoot people in the dark. Some of these arms were being sold to developing countries, to armies in developing countries. And I started having conversations with some of my colleagues about some of the human rights issues related to this. And I started getting more and more ethical qualms about what was going on, and particularly around the way my company was making an awful lot of money out of these, these exports. Disillusioned, I decided to opt for a career change. I went back to university, finished my degree, and I did a PhD in climate science. Then I did um, postdoctoral research in climate change policy and economics. And I, one of my major areas was research on carbon trading. And funding was tight, as it so often is in research. And we took some, decided to take some money from a major fossil fuel corporation. They seemed to be interested in low-carbon solutions, and so we took some money, we did some research, and then I started to become concerned about the way they're interpreting my research, and I thought, misinterpreting my research. We had some awkward conversations. The funding was not renewed. Eventually, I moved to Scientists for Global Responsibility, where I work now, and this is an organization which is particularly concerned about ethical issues in science and technology. And with colleagues, we decided we wanted to do some more detailed research about corporate influence on science. And we did some in-depth work, and um, we became very concerned about what we found. And we called these problems, problems of corporate science. Now, the first one of these is concern around individual research studies being distorted. Um, there's a lot of social science research around a problem called sponsorship bias. This is where the results of a scientific study are more likely to be favorable to the funder of that study. It's not that anybody's making results up. It's, it's much more subtle than that. And it, it can often be something to do with just the choices that are made by the funder of which researcher to fund. It's been examined extensively in medical research, particularly that funded by the pharmaceutical <coughs> industry. And there's a lot of concern around this problem in organizations like the British Medical Journal and various other medical organizations. And they've been taking steps to try and tackle the problem. But it's not just in medical research and, and um, that funded by the pharmaceutical industry. There's also this problem has been found in, in work funded by the food industry and the chemicals industry and the agricultural industry. Here are a few examples from three major studies carried out in the US and um, in Europe. Each of them looked at hundreds of health and um, clinical trials around um, the particular areas that they worked in, pharmaceuticals and food in this case. And they found industry funding led to favorable re results being many times more likely, sometimes considerably so, than research funded by a neutral source. But there were wider problems. And um, part of this is to do with the public presentation of science. Now, when companies have a new product, they market that product, and they try and tell you the best things about that product. And you regularly see battles between watchdogs like the Advertising Standards Authority and corporations over what they can and can't say about their product and, and how accurate that is. Um, but there are 
wider problems around corporates being involved in public information campaigns. Of course, the no most notorious example of this is the tobacco industry and the way over many decades it funded public information campaigns that downplayed the health risks of smoking. We've also seen the fossil fuel industry funding public information campaigns downplay the risks of climate change. And the most recent example is um, the food industry funding um, information campaigns about sugar and downplaying the health problems related to sugar. There's an overarching problem here, is that economic growth is, and there's a narrow economic focus that um, is being pushed on science. And there are uh, three key factors, I think. One is that the majority of research and development is funded by corporations or the commercial sector, more than two-thirds. The secondly is that publicly funded science is being pushed more and more towards prioritizing contribution to economic growth above contribution to, for example, environmental protection. And the third aspect is about prioritizing science for technology over science that informs policy. UK science policy is a particularly good example of corporate science. Uh, Within this, over the last few years, we've seen um, the government prioritising what they've called the great technologies. They've put an extra billion pounds into funding research where UK scientists are thought to have a major lead, and also um, they feel the government feels that there is potential for new economic sectors to arise out of these research fields. There's some consideration of social or health or environmental aspects, but generally it's the economic focus that's a big thing. And, and another worrying aspect of this is the way in which risky or controversial technologies are being prioritised. Um, for example, there's research on autonomous systems, and there's a lot of concerns about some of this work, that it could lead to a rapid rise in robo robotic warfare. Another area of concern is synthetic biology and the way in which this can be used to create new life forms and what happens if those life forms get out of the laboratory. Oops. So I want to suggest an alternative approach, one that I call a science for society approach. The first back aspect of this is that we need more safeguards to reduce bias in individual research studies. So we need more openness about who's funding what research, and we need more researchers and research institutes who are independent of corporate funding. Or at least, if they take corporate funding, there's also funding to balance it from another organisation with a competing interest, such as a health charity or an environmental organisation. The second aspect of this is more public debates on science and technology issues. And I mean face-to-face -face debates, directly between the scientists and the public, sidestepping the advertising, sidestepping the um, public information campaigns and mainstream media. The fir third aspect of this is what I call great challenges, not great technologies. There are huge issues out there confronting the world, whether it's trying to prevent war or tackle social injustice or prevent global environmental damage or, or tackle... Um, ill health across the world. There are some good examples of, of some publicly funded um, work in this area. Um, a particular example uh, that I like is the Longitude Prize, which is a publicly funded prize awarded to scientists. The last time was in 2014, and it was awarded for research and development around antibiotic resistance, which is a major um, problem facing society. But there's only £10 million put into this pot funding for this re research, just 1% of that available to the great technologies. I became a scientist because I'm intensely curious about the world, but in being a scientist I've become concerned about the way in which powerful interests, particularly corporations, can use and misuse science and technology. There are so many major threats out there facing human society, whether it's climate change or the threat of accidental nuclear war or global food insecurity or antibiotic resistance, and we need a lot more science and technology to help us tackle those threats. And, that, and we need to reclaim science and technology by embracing a science for society perspective to give us a stable and secure fu future. Thank you. <laughs>